Great. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks very much for having me here today. Great to see some familiar faces in the, in the room and great to meet you in person. I want to give uh, Copy with PK a shout out. That's how I came across Rubita and her team. And uh, it's been a great sort of 12 to 18 months connecting with new people on that platform. Um, we talked about coffee before. Uh, 40 minutes with me will feel like you've had about seven coffees. So hopefully you haven't had too many this morning because we're about to run through some content in the next 40 minutes. Right, so quickly we'll go through the introduction. I've had a really lovely uh, welcome from Rabina, that was fantastic. We'll go into the CX Foundations. Uh, I'll be unpacking the Xs. No, there won't be a list of my Xs on the board. I'll actually be going through all the CXs, BXs, PXs that we uh, need to hear about, and then I'll wrap up. So hopefully we'll have some question time at the end. Otherwise, I'm here all day, so please feel free to grab me during one of the breaks. Uh, I won't go too much into my experience, Rubina certainly did a really good job of that, but I must say I've had a wonderful career so far, and who knows what's to come in the future, but working in tourism I've had an opportunity to see many, many brilliant things. <clears throat> Running the Tourism Central Australia, flying over Uluru in a, in a helicopter into the Camel Cup, and with Tourism Barossa drinking some of the best wines in the world, and now I'm the Flurio, so I really do love my job, getting, getting out of bed's easy in the morning. Um, and education, so I'm an UniSA alumni, so shout out to those guys. A qualified professional researcher, and have recently done some short courses in CX and CX design, so certainly an advocate for continuing to learn and sharing that learning. I'll just briefly take you through, um, I don't know if I can do it on here. Sorry, I just need someone to help me with the getting the, oh, we go. I'll just take you through a quick video about XB, because that'll probably help understand who we are. Emotions are part of who we are. And when they're born from direct experience, they shape what we think about the brands we deal with in our lives. And that's where it really gets interesting. The truth is, consumers are more sophisticated and empowered than ever before. They're more discerning. They're more opinionated, they're more influential. And if they can, they're much more likely to go elsewhere if they're dissatisfied. That's why every organization needs to be in the business of delivering exceptional customer experiences. And it's why XP was created, because we can help your organization to be the best it can be. It's thinking about the customer, what their understanding of your organization and your promise is, and understanding how they interact with the product and service and experience. We then take that information and we project to the future. Is that the customer that you want for the future? Are the products and services of today delivering upon the expectation and the wants and needs of the customers of tomorrow? And we put it together and we say, well, are the staff in your organisation delivering upon the promise that you've made to your customers? And if not, how can we remedy that? Does the tech and the interfaces that you have with your customers, the point of sales, the website, the social media platforms, are they developed and designed thinking about the customer at heart? And the brand, is your promise easily understood? Is a promise to your customer what you're delivering in everything you do? And there's XB. XB's powerful discovery and diagnosis process evaluates your customer's experience against key performance criteria. The resulting recommendations will equip you with vital insights and an actionable strategy to transform your relationships with the people that matter most to your organisation. It's a distinctive, considered, creative approach that will help you embed exceptional customer service for now and for the journey ahead. If you'd like to transform your customer's experience and elevate your business's performance, it's time you are talking to XP. XP, be exceptional. Might need some help to get back to the presentation, sorry. Well, there you go. I feel like my, um, my presentation's done now because that's what we do at XB. Uh, we'll just head on to some of our clients we're working with. I guess this gives some credibility as to why I'm speaking with you today. Um, I'll just, yep, yeah, great. We've done a lot of work with brand agencies, which is really important because they'll be testing the concepts and so forth that you design. And we've done some work with fantastic South Australian companies such as RAA, Stratco. We've been working with Chivo and, and most recently IKEA. We work across a lot of government agencies and one of the highlights of my career has been working with the Department of Environment and Water and their Parks and Wildlife Service, helping to reimagine the visitor experience on Kangaroo Island after the bushfires. 
So it's, it's vast, the work that we do, but it's really rewarding as well to really see some um, outcomes on the ground. So let's get into it. Core CX principles. There's only one boss, the customer. And I'm not saying the customer's always, always right, but you absolutely, in CX, you have to fundamentally know who your customer is. You have to listen to them and design for them. If you don't know who they are, what they're saying, how they feel about your product or service, then actually even delivering the product or service is not really worth it. You need to be knowing who your customer is. Who your customer is. So who's heard that famous uh, quote from Henry, Henry Ford about the motor car? If we ask customers what they wanted, we'd just get faster horses. So in this scenario, you still need to ask customers, but you don't necessarily need to do exactly what they say. You need to ask and preempt what they need because customers don't necessarily get it right all the time, but you need to understand why they're saying what they're saying and what they need. How does CX affect the bottom line? This is important to all of us, and whether you're in, the in a commercial organisation or a community organisation, government, federal, state, local, it's really important that you understand CX because it can be customer experience or community experience. So 50% of customers who've had a, had a bad experience will switch. This has gone up 18% since 2016. That's a huge jump. So in 2021, 50% of your customers will switch if they've had a bad experience. 92% of customers will abandon your company or brand altogether after two or three bad experiences. So people do have a slight threshold for, for a bad experience. We do understand that things happen. 92% will abandon you altogether. 13% of people spread the word, but they spread it to 15 or more people. And now this stat in particular is three years old. So what do you think is happening in today's day? They're probably spreading the word on social media and that 15 people turns into many, many, many more. So I guess the ne negative experience is if, if someone has a bad experience, that's what happens to your business. On the other side of the scale, what happens when you actually deliver good ex customer experiences or exceptional customer experiences? Well, you get more money, you get more loyalty, and they impulse buy. So we're hearing from Mal Chir a bit later on, and I'd be really interested to hear from him from the customer loyalty program. If 49% of people impulse buy because they've had a good experience and they pay more, it makes sense that you deliver exceptional experiences. So one of the first questions I have for you to reflect on your own businesses, and I see most people have notepads here, think about those stats on your business. Can you afford for 50% of your customers to switch? Can you afford 92% of your customers to completely abandon your business altogether? I don't think we can, so focusing on CX will have a positive impact on your business. And I stand here to guarantee you in the next 12 months, if you take on board some of the things I talk about today, it will positively impact your business and if it doesn't, come and see me next year and I'll offer you some free consultancy because it will absolutely impact either your brand, your reputation, or the bottom line, or all of the above. And you can hold me to that, it's on film. So today I'll, just, today I'll be going through um, some case, a case study just to underpin what we've been doing. We've been working with West Beach Parks for decades now, but in particular in the last three years, we've been working on their customer experience and brand, in particular understanding the different types of customers. So who here is actually holidayed at West Beach Parks? A few people? So West Beach Parks has a couple of accommodation properties. They've got some sporting fields, they've got um, a, bo a boat ramp, they've got tenants there. But a couple of years ago, we went them and started to think about who's the customer for their holiday park, which is essentially a caravan and leisure park, and who's the customer for what was then known as their resort experience, which has recently been rebranded to the retreat. The work we've done with them over the past 12 months has had a significant impact on the bottom line, and I'll talk to you about some of the th uh, changes they've made, which has actually fundamentally improved their organisation, their business, and their staff experience. So you saw the model, this is our XB universe. Think about the customer experience and the customer's the heart, the sun of the universe and all the other things moving around that's the planets and it's in the orbit. Now, they're all of equal importance. You have some people saying, well, tech's the most important thing in my business and someone else will say, no, my customer service staff or my employees or my brand, I'm, I'm working really hard on my brand recognition. I'm working really hard on designing the product or service that people are looking for. They are all equally important because if one of them goes out of whack, there will soon be a big black hole. So we work on me measuring and monitoring all of those things in unison to make sure that they continue to orbit and we continue to have the sun at the middle. Um, usability in the UX is integrated between all of them. It's not just about employees and customer service. It's about employees and the tech that they use and how easy it is to do their job to deliver exceptional experiences. It's about 
the product and service and how people actually interface with that and how easy that is to actually use that product or service. It's not that alone. So I'm using a couple of quotes today from some brilliant people who've um, done very well in business. So the key is to set realistic customer expectations and not just to meet them, but to exceed them, preferably in unexpected and helpful ways. Rubina before mentioned surprise and delight, which is one of the terms we use in CX. So exceed expectations. That's one of the fundamental foundations of exceptional experience. Exceed expectations. <clears throat> Don't just meet them, exceed them. Timely resolution. So get things done. Get things done in a timely fashion. This could be in a digital space, so really understanding how quickly people want things to be done and want things to be resolved, but also in a customer service space, making sure we make things easy in a timely, timely manner. So effort. This is particularly poignant in the digital world. Make things easy, not just for the customer, but for the staff. So the way that they're using technology, making that easier for the customers, but also making it easy for the customer at the front interface. The KISS principle, keep it simple. Empathy, understanding and knowing your customers intimately. Walk a mile in their shoes, it's such a cliche, but when you're making decisions on behalf of your customer, know your customer. Um, one of the things you learn in market research is I am not your target audience, and often what we do, particularly in marketing, it's gut feel marketing, we're in, a, we're in a world now of data-driven insights. So for this, if you're trying to empathise with your customer, but you've not stopped to think about what they're feeling, what they're saying, what they're thinking, then you really need to put yourself in their shoes. We often make decisions based on how we feel about things and how we would respond in those circumstances. You are not them. So that's really important to show empathy. In Australia, personalisation is the number one factor that, that influences customer experience. So it's not just about um, being friendly, it's about making people feel like more than just a number. So you think in a tech world, that's about having customer reference numbers, having customer platforms, having profiles. People want to feel unique. We're in an era where we believe we're particularly special and the next generation after us are going to be, going to be even more attuned to personalisation. They want things to be created for them. They don't want EDMs that go out to everybody that says everything about every product. They want to know about what you like. I want to hear about the company telling me what I want because I'm special. So personalisation, number one thing for CX in Australia. It shifts in different cultures, but here it's personalisation. So tailor it for people. There is absolutely no excuse in today's digital world not to tailor experiences and communications to your customers. And trust. So I think about um, you know, the last 12 to 18 months about trust. You need to ensure and engender trust in your customers, whether that's through communicating with them that you have the right qualifications, your business has the right accreditations, or even things like you're doing the right thing by COVID, you're doing the right thing, integrity and safety. This is particularly important with government organisations. Engendering trust is absolutely essential because sometimes we don't choose who we, who we take a service from. Sometimes we have to because particularly in government but you need to trust them to actually trust they're doing the right thing by you. All of this doesn't matter unless you measure it. Because I can say all of these things, but how do you know you're doing well? How do you know you're doing poorly in these areas? So these are the ways that you can measure CX. Customer satisfaction tools and customer satisfaction scores and measuring the trend over time. Don't just go home today, measure one thing and then not look at it ever again because it's good to benchmark and see those trends. Net promoter score. This is a controversial one. I know there's definitely schools of thought, particularly um, where we are today, about whether net promoter score is a relevant metrics or not. I'm here to tell you from a market research perspective, we use it, but we use it to track, we use it to benchmark, and we also ask the question why. If you give me a score of zero to 10, and I give you eight, and we move on, it doesn't mean anything when you ask why you gave that score. So my preface with net promoter score, even the net trust score, Always ask customers why they gave that score, because it's really interesting to understand, particularly if they're low or high, what's driving that score. Um, customer feedback, it can be as simple as pen and paper, back of an envelope, back of a napkin. Social listening, social listening and social tracking is really important, so customer feedback, even if it is the observation of that feedback, not direct to you. Um, Google web and social analytics. I mean, it's a no-brainer, and I would hope that everybody in this room would understand and be tracking that on their own um, web platforms or digital footprints. But if you're not, the first thing, number one out of this session is to start tracking the data that you have available to you. Usability testing. So this is a really exciting one. If you currently have a product in market or a service, 
and you're not quite sure if it's performing as you would like it to perform, there's usability testing. From a web perspective, we can also understand people's navigation on websites by using tools like Lookback, where you can actually track their, their movement on the website and ask them questions and probe as you go. So if you, if you don't know if your web is performing or your web presence is performing for you, do some usability testing. Uh, social listening, customer feedback and net trust. <clears throat> So get closer than ever to your customers, so close you can tell them what they need well before they realise it themselves. So this is about the Henry Ford and the motor car and the, the faster horses. Get close to them, understand why they say faster horses. It's not that they want faster horses, they just want something faster. So it's about the innovation and the design. And it's about making sure we're getting ahead of those customers. I just mentioned CX data is everywhere. Hands up in the room if anybody tracks any of the things I was talking about before. So in a room of marketers, I reckon that's about 70%. So we think about, there's about 30% of you that perhaps aren't tracking at the moment, absolutely imperative that you're tracking. CX data is everywhere. In fact, you can drown in it. So mine the data you've got that's available and be really specific about what you want to track. Map their journey. So understand the data, map the journey, design with your customers in mind, measure their feedback, Repeat, repeat, repeat. So has anybody heard of human design thinking or human-centred design thinking? A few people. Basically, the customer is at the heart of your design process. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It's about measuring, going back, improving, measuring, going back, improving. Constantly, constantly. That's the world we live in. We don't need to be perfect, but we need to be going back and measuring as we go. So ask yourself in your business, is your customer of today the customer you want or the same customer of tomorrow? Because there's twofold, there's twofold to this process. Understanding your customer of today and how they're actually um, interacting with your product and service, but there's also the customer you want to attract and what they need in their services. So you have to do these customer journey maps for both. Just an example of the West Beach Holiday Parks, we did a few personas for them. I'll just give an example of different types of personas and how this actually informs customer experience design. So Holiday Park persona, Bob and Marg, always on the road, they live with no fixed address, they literally travel around Australia in a van. Think about Marg and Bob. Perhaps it's our parents or our grandparents or our neighbours and we know these people really well. Do they want the same experience as Daz and Shaz, the family who normally go to Bali and last year they couldn't go? So suddenly they're going, well, I'm looking for a, a holiday destination, I'm stuck in South Australia with my kids, what do I do? So Marg and Bob want something entirely different to Daz and Shaz but often we just give them the same thing. It's one size fits all, right? And not just one size fits all for their actual visitor experience when they're at the park, but also their booking experience, their follow-up experience, their, their on-site experience. So Daz and Shaz have a highly different expectation about what they want in a holiday to Marg and Bob. So we went through a process of designing all these personas for all of their properties and resorts, and we went through a process of training their staff so when you're taking a reservation, we're online, you're chatting to someone, or you're face to face at the desk and Marg and Bob walk in, you know that Marg and Bob would like to have a chat. So you had to make some time for them because they need to feel a personal interaction, they need to feel empathy. Daz and Shaz, they want kids club, they want to sit by the pool and have a drink and they want the kids to have a good time because they're missing out on their Bali holiday and they're not feeling very good about it. So upon um, check-in, we need to make sure we're actually designing and delivering the experience that that particular persona would feel really good about. Surprise and delight, pop some ice blocks in the freezer in summer. You know, those little things like that can make a significant difference to your customer's experience and then their recommendation of your business. So brand experience. Uh, any brand experts in the room? Oh, good. So BX. So brand for a company is like a reputation for a person. You earn reputation by trying to do the hard things well, and often we leave the hard things because they're just too hard. But in this case, get on top of it and do the hard things well. So if a brand is a promise to your customer, customer experience is how you deliver on that promise. So think about brand experience as the promise. So who can tell me or think about what your brand or your company's promise is? Show of hands who know you can articulate really easily your brand promise, your customer promise. So a few people. So this is a really tough one. If you yourself can't quickly articulate what your promise to the customer is, how does the customer understand what it is? How do they know what you're promising? And therefore, 
How do they know? How can they measure you on what you're promising? So your customer promise, your brand promise, must be translated across all of these elements. So your visual identity, your comms, your personality, your brand personality, your positioning, brand salience. Are you the first brand that people think about in the category that you, you sell or you're delivering in? And how does your brand promise translate across those other X's we're talking about? So tech and staff and products and services. Let me just go ahead to this. So what happens if you're promising someone that you're a sustainable company, but there's no touch points that demonstrate that? What happens if you promise that you're innovative and cutting edge, but your website's really old? What happens if you're promising to people that you're going to have a great holiday and your staff are grumpy? So your brand promise must be translated across all touch points, across the whole journey. So from the research, the purchase, the follow-up, and that re-engagement after. The brand is the why. Here are three brands I'm sure you all know well. Think different, Apple. So not only is that brand fundamental in that business, in the technology they design and the innovation, but also when they employ staff, it's absolutely what they think about and work with their staff always thinking different. They celebrate staff and thinking different. IKEA, to create a better everyday life for the many people. We're currently working with IKEA and as a third party for provider, we had to go through lots of uh, paperwork to demonstrate our sustainable practices as a third party because IKEA's platform says, not only do we deliver our customers this experience, we want every touch point as a business to deliver the same. West Beach Parks come to life, that's their promise. So when you get there, whether it's a holiday, a sporting field, you go down for, to a restaurant, you go and use the boat harbour, no matter what it is, you're coming to life. They're promising that you're going to have basically an, an ex excellent experience. UX, this is usability across all of these touch points. So people might say UX, TechX, CX are all the same thing. We would say that the UX is the how. The BX is the promise, the brand is the promise. The CX is delivering the promise. And the UX is how you deliver that promise. It's not just digital, but across the whole, um, the touch points. I'll keep moving. Think about your product and service. We thought about the customer, who your customers are, uh, how your customers interact with everything. Have a think about the touch points in your journey. Do you think across the customer's journey when they're researching what your product or service or brand is, when they're engaging with your brand and when they're re-engaging, how easy is it across that journey? How personal is that journey or that, those touch points? Is, is technology delivery exactly what you're promising? So coming to TechX, um, it's a technology that organisations use to deliver exceptional experiences. It doesn't have to be customer facing necessarily. It doesn't necessarily have to be the website, but certainly a good place to start. How about CRMs, customer relationship management tools? So something like Salesforce brings all your customer, <coughs> customer data in and it helps to actually understand and to measure and track your customer interactions. Point of sales and dashboards, making sure they're integrated. If you're sitting there with a calculator, with a person in front of you, calculating different tariffs and then putting it in a reservation system, that's not making anybody life, anybody's life easier. We found with West Beach Parks, one of the challenges was that their, that their tech tools were not integrated and therefore a customer waiting in line was having a less than enjoyable experience because they didn't really know what was going on. So making sure that the tech is integrated is an absolute um, fundamental part of this. So thinking about the stats I spoke about before, 57% of internet users say they won't recommend a business with a poorly designed website. That's half of the people who use the internet, which is pretty much half of the population. So they won't recommend you if you've got a bad website. 38% of people will stop engaging with the website if the content and layout is unattractive and hard to use. So if you've got those people to your website and you've been doing analytics and you know who they are on your, front, your home page and they're bouncing out, they're not gonna come back. So if you're losing them at that first page, you should be analyzing your web traffic and see how many clicks and pages they're going through, and if they're not achieving the goals you set, there's a problem. You should be going in and finding out, along that journey on your website, what's going on, why they're bouncing out, because 38% of those people will not come back. None of it looks good in the business, and so you think about these little incremental gains, this will help your bottom line. 
So in addition to the tech, there are a few tools out there. We talked about social listening and social tracking before. Um, has anybody used HubSpot, Hootsuite, or Sprout Social? Yep, great. Look, if you're time poor or resource poor in your business, I would absolutely recommend any of these, um, these tools, the social listening or social tracking. They're dashboards by way by which you can track hashtags, you can track trends, you can track mentions. You can also in one place see all of your activity. You can see your competitors' activity if you've got them in your, your dashboards. So that's really important. If people say, I've got no time, well, this is the number one tool that's going to help you to understand, track and measure, and actually create content for your social platforms. Um, Keyhole was one that I found, about, I found out about the other day. Has anybody heard of Keyhole? Yep, so a tool, they can track hashtags, they can track influencers, they can also, they've got an AI embedded in Keyhole that can predict the success and reach of your posts. So I think that's really interesting as well. So using some of these tools to make your life easier, your staff's lives easier, have a bigger impact on your brand with your customers, and it all comes back to the holistic customer experience. Ask yourself, we've had a bit of uh, questions to the audience, but ask yourself, how is your tech delivering to your customers? Is it delivering exceptional experiences? Is it enabling personalised experiences? Is it easy? Is it easy to find? Is it easy to navigate? We've got some sessions this afternoon on SEO. How are you being found? And when they get to you, are you delivering upon the promise? Who knows? And most importantly for tech, is your tech delivering on the customer of tomorrow? Because they are here. Product experience. This is a really interesting quote from LinkedIn. If you're having trouble getting customers engaged, churn is creeping up, or you're struggling to meet upsell goals, but only have resources to fix one thing, fix onboarding. If a customer starts to fall off with low engagement, every passing day makes it harder to fix. So if you've worked really hard to get them onto your platform, engage with your service or product, but then they've got no idea what to do, they're not really sure what it's about, they don't really understand what the product or service is, you are wasting your time even getting them there. So you've got to make sure that the onboarding, um, I have a friend and a colleague who, who works with a tech startup, and part of her role is actually getting people onboarded onto the platform. Because once they get there and they're onboarded well, they'll use it and they'll recommend it. But if you don't have the right tools in place to onboard people in the tech in the first place, or your product or service in the first place, then they're confused, it's not easy, you will lose them. So product experience is what the customer experiences when using a product their thoughts, their emotions and motives. So it might be a digital platform, or for West Beach Parks, it might be actually them using the parks, they're attending the parks. So in this particular experience, we worked with West Beach Parks on their product, which used to be known as the resort, so it was the more high-end accommodation product, and now it's been rebranded re the retreat. What we found out from customers was, their perception of a retreat or a resort is a relaxed holiday. They want space and time, they want to sit back and kick back, they don't want the hustle and bustle of the holiday park. That's the caravan park. That's over there. So as a customer, if you've booked the resort, you want to be getting that sort of experience. So they went back at the um, mid last year and decided to rebrand with Fuller to the retreat. They've actually put up some new accommodation, which are these fantastic safari tents with baths on the front, front deck overlooking the sand dunes. They've got these other cabins, which are high end, because they said, you know what? Our customers coming to the retreat want a high end, luxury experience that's really relaxing on their holiday, lots of space, hearing the waves. And because of that, they're delivering the elevated product to the customer that they understand. So are the products and services that you offer tailored to the customers, or is it one size fits all? And how well do your products and services reflect your brand promise? Again, if you're a tech company promising, that you've got this innovative software, but people don't know how to use it, then that's a bit of a challenge, and that really does damage the brand and the brand promise itself. And finally, one of the most important parts, I did say that the universe was all equal, but employee experience. If we consistently exceed the expectation of our employees, then we will consistently exceed the expectation of our customers. Employees are fundamental to the success of customer experience. So it's not just about great customer service, that's one transaction. Is your organisational structure tailored to deliver exceptional experiences? What I mean by that, do you have people in your business? So West Beach Parks now have a customer experience manager who works across the whole organisation in enabling them to deliver exceptional experiences. Job descriptions. 
do your job descriptions reflect the fact you want people working your business? You know, if you've got a person on the front counter, do they like their jobs? Have you got a people person on the front counter? Make sure you're recruiting the right people into the right jobs. It seems like a no-brainer, but I've worked with a government client that realised that lots of the people on the front counter didn't want to be on the front counter. So how do you think that reflected on the customer satisfaction, the customer experience? Pretty poorly. And with government, you have to be there. From a customer's perspective, you have to go and register your car, for example. So if the person you're dealing with isn't great, you're just on the back foot to start with. Onboarding, making sure that your staff are up to speed with the organisation and that they understand your promise. And you know what, even hand on my heart, you know, in my business we could be doing this better. And so onboarding, making sure the people that work with you and for you understand what you're promising. Um, training and living the brand. So with West Beach Parks, we did a training with all staff. I'm talking back of house, front of house, gardeners, electricians, security staff. We trained them on their promises and the brand because as a customer touch point, they were in front of customers all day long and they didn't really feel that there was any, it wasn't their role to deliver exceptional experiences because they're doing their job. But customers said, well, that's the only person I talk to. So making sure that customers, at your staff have the training on CX. And also strategic planning, planning about CX goals. Another client we've worked with, you've got a customer service team, a call centre, that, uh, that the promise of the customer is personalised service and we listen. But your call centre stats and KPIs, you've got to, get the, got to get off the phone within 30 seconds. How can you deliver personalised, tailored experiences to people in 30 seconds? So if your individual KPIs in your business don't meet your CX goals, you have to think about the strategic structure of that because you'll be working at cross purposes in your business. Does your organisation have a culture built on CX? So I said before, think about the stats before, about the value to the bottom line, about the more money, more spend, more loyalty. Two thirds of customer loyalty comes from CX. So if your culture doesn't have a culture of CX, but that is what is driving customer loyalty, it's also driving people out the door, if it's a bad customer experience, that's fundamental. So just I'll wrap up in a moment. If every day we're saying, how can we keep this customer happy? How can we get ahead in innovation by doing this? Because if we don't, somebody else will. So for all of those people who are bouncing out of your website, those people who've had a bad experience or two or three bad experiences, they've completely, 90% have completely abandoned your company altogether, someone else is standing there with a product or service, delivering it in an exceptional manner, ready to take that customer. Or in a government perspective, there's no choice, therefore the noise gets really loud about those bad experiences. So the catch cry is XB, be exceptional. And I hope that uh, we've learned today the importance of customer experience and how it can enable exceptional customer experience. Thanks, guys. Jackie, where are you going? It's question time. <laughs> we've got about five minutes for questions and uh, our roving mics, one up the back there, Lena, just... Uh, there's one here, any other, and there's one over here. So uh, I think Ollie's there first. Let's start this side and come back across. Hello. Um, I saw that you, well, everyone saw, that you um, work with IKEA and Apple versus West Beach Parks, and obviously West Beach is SA. Um, brands like IKEA and Apple, which are, you know, worldwide, um, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, understand, like, where, I would have thought they had, like, more of a global, um, policy or guideline, I don't know, framework on customer experience, things like that. How does it work like when they engage with you on a local level? Yep, so full disclosure, Microsoft was just an example of a brand, so we don't. I'd love to. Apple, if, oh, sorry, Apple and Microsoft are the two. I'd love to work with them. But IKEA, we deal with them on customer experience. So we, at a local level, in store, so what is their customer experience in store here and we're tracking it. We're also working with them from a market research perspective around um, product design and development to the market. So. They've got global platforms and programs that they look, they're looking at implementing here in Australia. I'm under a strict NDA, but uh, we, are, we are here. Um, and yes, yeah, so we're really excited here at an Adelaide level that we do get global brands and we do get national brands here in Adelaide that do engage local suppliers to help them. But often it is within a South Australian or a national context, not the global context. But you're right, they do have a whole CX team. I think that kind of goes back to the point yesterday we were talking about localising content and, um, you know, that sort of hyper-local approach and certainly Bank SA yesterday were talking a lot about um, the patriotism of South Australians and I think from my experience um, we are a bit of a different state, a different city, 
Um, we're all very proud to be living in the third most livable city in the world, all that kind of thing. So I think sometimes there is that opportunity there. Um, you know, the brands want to look at it and go, well, hang on, this might be a bit different, so we need to perhaps, it's an opportunity for testing. I have heard in the past that McDonald's, I don't know if anyone can verify this, but I have heard this, um, that McDonald's actually treat Adelaide as a test city. Um, and that, you know, we see a lot of different limited time only products here through our Maccas. Uh, I've, I've heard the Glenelg and Rose um, site material, but I don't know if that's yeah. true. Yeah. So you probably see, like, you know, the chocolate soft serve, like, I don't know if the Eastern States have got that, but obviously they've been testing that through a few different ones here. So I think Adelaide's a, a really interesting place for that. And perhaps, Jackie, you can, yeah, well, so on that. On our McGregor Tan side, our market research company, we've been around in South Australia for 45 years. And Adelaide is absolutely seen as a representative community of Australian um, perception. And it's an easy place to do market research. So absolutely, South Australia and Adelaide. We often do um, testing for global brands here in Adelaide to roll out to the Australian market because we're easy to talk to, but we're also quite representative of the Australian population. So doing work here, they see that South Australia and Adelaide is an easy place to do business. Yeah. So, but it's representative of the perception. So absolutely, that's 100% true. Great. Was there any follow-up from that side? All good? OK. And then I think we had a question over here. Yes, Rob, lovely to hear from you again. Um, yeah, it's been a few years since I did my undergraduate degree, but back then they were talking about the really strong correlation between awareness and market share, and always saying, well, if it, all you have to worry about is make sure everyone knows about you and they'll buy your stuff. But I suspect with online reviews and the ability to share your experiences that that has possibly shifted. I just wondered if you've seen any data around that. We, like, it all makes sense logically, but what does the actual data say around um, CX relating to uh, market share and purchase. So a couple of points in that. From a brand awareness perspective, just because someone's aware of your brand doesn't mean they know what you do. So um, we often find in market research, if you ask them an awareness question, the next thing is to say, and what do they do? Because I'll give you an example. One of our clients is Bentleys. They're, a, they're a, one of the a top eight advisory firms in Australia. We did a national project. You ask people what Bentleys do, they do cars. People, do, people in the field who understand advisory will say advisory, but other people say, yeah, yeah, I've heard of, I've heard of Bentleys. So they might get good statistics saying that 82% of the population is aware of your brand. But then when you drill down and say, well, what do they do? You know, 30% of the 82% are saying cars. Well, they actually don't know what you're doing. So from the perspective of brand awareness, absolutely, the awareness is only a good measure if you actually have that salience, so people actually know what you, you do in the category that you are providing services in. The next one is absolutely the different touch points now. So just because someone's aware of a product or service and what you do, um, people are researching more and more at different touch points about do you do it well? How do you do it? What are you delivering? Is it easy? So thinking about some of the, the products and services out there, you might know of a brand, you go online, you, you research if that brand is delivering um, a good service. So actually I was thinking about some research I did last night in some focus groups. We are thinking about switching to d different energy providers and people said number one is price. That's fine. Number two is customer service. And how do you know what customer service, if it's good customer service, you talk to friends and family, you go online, you look at reviews, you look at social media, you might put questions out there. So people are driven by price often, but absolutely reputation. And that reputation comes from customer experience a lot of the time, customer service, having people to talk to, having good experiences in that platform. So I don't know if that answers your question, but there's certainly brand awareness is underpinned by a whole lot of other um, considerations now when we're thinking about purchasing, particularly when CX is such a driver for um, loyalty. Any other questions from the crowd? I was slowly scanning. Oh, Meredith down the front. You were very quiet yesterday. <laughs> Saving it up for today. Um, so I work for a not so sexy vehicle le leasing fleet management. Um, we work really hard on building our net promoter score, measuring it, tracking it. Um, can you explain the difference between the net promoter score and the net trust score and perhaps something, ways you can measure uh, the two? Yep, so net promoter score for those, it's, net promoter score is a direct reflection of customer experience. So customer satisfaction score is one um, moment in time. So were you satisfied with that experience, that, that, that interaction? A customer effort score is another one good to talk to. So how easy was that um, particular interaction? So often on websites you might get a quick box pop up saying, you know, how do you rate this experience or this, how easy was it to do? 
Um, Net Promoter Score is the whole experience end-to-end. -end. So you might have an individual transaction that's good or bad, but it won't necessarily reflect on your Net Promoter Score. Because say, for example, you walk into a place and the person behind the counter was particularly grumpy. But you love the brand, you love, you love the coffee, you go there every morning. But on that one individual transaction, you might not be satisfied. But overall, you'd be highly likely to recommend it to your friends and family. So as they add up, it's accumulation of all of those experiences and touch points that gives you the net promoter score. So if on a score of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend this coffee shop to friends and family is the net promoter score metrics. So the difference between that and trust is on a scale of zero to 10, how much do you trust the organisation you're dealing with? And that's about that credibility and validity. So there are some brands out there that you might love what they do, you might love what they deliver, but you're not quite sure about the organisation itself. The organisation might have had bad press. The organisation may have had, um, you know, you may have had bad experience with them. You don't trust that the people they employ actually have the credibility. So they're two different measures, but combined. Because so, you might be satisfied, or you might still recommend them, but you might not necessarily trust what they do. So I think you just need to understand why they give that score. So why don't you trust them or why do you trust them? Oh, because their staff will have badges with their qualifications or because I heard in the news three years ago that they're treating their staff really badly. So they're different measures. Okay, if you've got any more chat questions for Jackie, please hit her up in the breaks. She'll be here all day.